What's going on everybody, Mordom here, this time bringing you my review after 100% for Miasma Chronicles, the latest TRPG from the Bearded Ladies who are behind the titles of Mutant Year Zero as well as Corruption 2029. And just like those titles, this one takes place in a post-apocalypse. But before we get into all of that, I review games after 100% all the time to set me apart from other reviewers on the platform. If you're curious about everything that entails, there's a video linked in the description below that we'll go over it, because while that does include the achievements, there is more to it. That said, my Steam profile is public and linked below as well. Now, on the topic of the achievements, one in particular I wanted to mention because it is bugged in some form or fashion, and that is the Silent But Violent achievement. This is an achievement for taking down 15 enemies with stealth, and realistically, that should be one of the first achievements people get, more than likely. However, on Steam, it does not seem to be triggering properly properly. I had actually written it off as bugged and then laid into my second playthrough. It just unlocked while I was in regular combat, so I'm not exactly sure what's going on there, and judging by the Steam statistics, at least a few other people have gotten this. But either way, there's clearly something wrong with it, so I wanted to mention it. And then lastly, before we actually dive into this one, I do need to mention that I got a review copy of this game from the Bearded Ladies like right before the game launched, so not really enough time to actually get a review made, which is why we are a few days out from its release now, but nonetheless, I did receive a copy of this game from the developers. That said, let's actually dive into this one. Now, Miasma Chronicles is a post-apocalyptic TRPG. It takes place in an alternative version of the universe, though, that we live in, in America, after the apocalypse has happened, of course. And as far as the tactics battles go, it primarily uses what I would consider an XCOM system, with a few tweaks to the gameplay to make it a bit more interesting, and if you've ever played Mutant Year Zero, you'll probably know basically what to expect. Now, I like to kick reviews of newer games off talking about the technical state of said game, how it's running, or how it ran for me at least in terms of bugs, things like that, and broadly speaking, I would say it runs pretty well. However, there are nonetheless a few issues that I think were worth pointing out, such as a variety of minor bugs, things that aren't likely to impede your gameplay in any substantial way, but are nonetheless common enough to be noticeable. Characters getting stuck on terrain when you're moving around, the time played on your save files being wildly inaccurate, and in that regard, the probably worst one I ran into is sometimes I couldn't interact with things and the only thing I could do was just reload the save and that seemed to fix it for whatever reason. Now, in terms of major problems, I did run into one that I wanted to mention and that is with the explosive barrels in-game. Now, if you just shoot those, they'll blow up, potentially damage anybody in the area, very standard stuff, but I did notice that if you use a grenade to blow up those barrels, sometimes that will crash the game. Not all the time, but like 30-40% of the time the game will crash or at the very least it will freeze and hang if it doesn't crash. Now the reason you might want to do this is because both the explosion damage from your grenade as well as the barrels will go through, which can be very devastating to larger enemies that are within range, but there is a good chance this might crash the game on you. Moving on from there though, we have the difficulty of the game. I wanted to talk about this a little bit because if you've never played one of the Bearded Ladies games, you might not be aware that as far as TRPGs go, they can be a little more unforgiving than most. And while Miasma Chronicles does give you more options than, say, Mutant Year Zero and how you approach things, if you try to run into every situation guns blazing, you're probably going to have a bad time. So let's talk about some of the difficulty here. The three primary ones are narrative, normal, and challenging. These are going to affect the HP of enemies, your HP, as well as how much healing you do after combat. Now, on narrative mode, enemies have less HP, you have more, and you fully heal after combat which means the game is much easier. However, even here, if you go in guns blazing to every encounter, you still might lose. Now, on normal, that's more of the standard experience, and as long as you are engaging with the systems properly, you'll wind up being okay, as long as you're not just trying to brute force everything. On this difficulty, though, you only recover half of your HP after battles. Then on challenging, enemies have more HP, you have a little less, and you only recover a quarter of your HP afterwards. But then we have Alpha Editor, which is the max difficulty mode. Now, it's a little bit harder than it's supposed to be right now, or at least according to the devs anyway over on their Steam forums, because right now Alpha Editor only allows you to use the autosaves the game provides. And while I think it's supposed to be saving at least in a couple different save files as it stands, the game saves 
saves in one save slot every single round of combat, meaning that it's very easy to back yourself into a corner if you aren't prepared and know what's coming. So because of that, I really wouldn't recommend Alpha Editor until you've played through the game at least once. But for the most part, this is the challenging version of the game with a couple more restrictions. Probably the most notable one, though, is that you only have a set number of turns to get your teammates up from the ground if they happen to lose all their HP. When that happens, you can heal teammates in combat via a throwable item, and if you don't do that within a set number of turns on Alpha Editor, they're just out for the rest of the combat. But another part of difficulty I wanted to mention here is the healing. After combat ends, you'll heal a set amount based on the difficulty difficulty setting you have it on. You will also fully heal every time your characters level up. It is possible to heal outside of combat, but you have to use your items from the menu to do so. There is no place to go and just get free healing. But one of the small quibbles I have with this game is that the menu for healing your characters out of combat is really clunky. While you can get to that menu easily enough, it might seem like you can't click on your characters to heal them, and that's because you have to click on the very specific part where it says plus so much health, which is very unintuitive, let's say. But nonetheless, it can be done. From there, though, let's actually talk a little bit about the story of this one. Miasma Chronicles is set in a post-apocalyptic version of the USA, and said apocalypse was caused by the miasma, a sort of liquid metal-like substance that covers most everything. It's known to mutate wildlife. Storms of it occasionally happen and wipe out towns, that kind of thing. And in the wake of this devastation, a family known as the First Family has retained a lot of the high technology available before the apocalypse happened. In the apocalypse's wake, they have set up a system that is honestly not dissimilar from feudalism, where across America they have set up various towns that are simply meant to gather resources. These resources are then collected by the First Family's robots, known as the Collectors, in exchange for continued supplies for these towns to exist. If they refuse to pay up their supplies, the Collectors wipe them all out. And in this way, the First Family keeps a sort of iron fist on what is left of humanity. But in this situation, we play as two characters known as Elvis and Dick who live in a mining town known as Sedentary. Elvis and his robot that he calls his brother Diggs have lived in Sedentary with each other ever since Elvis's mother left him behind years ago. She, however, left him a glove that is able to seemingly interact with miasma in some way, with the instructions that once he was able to use the glove to break through the miasma wall, he needs to come find her, which has been his goal for the last several years. However, this endeavor is kick-started when a band of mutant frogs start attacking our town. This prompts us to try to hurry up and break through the wall so we can get people to safety, which then leads into the rest of the story. Now, that's as much as I want to say on the story, because otherwise I'd just be outright spoiling things, but I do want to mention that I think the story is probably probably what I enjoyed the most about this game. I will say it does kind of give me some Star Wars vibes here and there, but broadly speaking, I thought it was really well done. Now, the writing doesn't exactly shine in a few places, but the broad narrative was inherently very interesting to me which helped me power through those moments. And as you work through the story and uncover various things about Elvis's past alongside what the miasma is, what it can do, I couldn't help but be drawn into this world's narrative. So, in my book, the story was very well done, though I admit the writing in certain places is kind of whatever. But from there, let's talk about progression systems a little bit. Relatively simple progression as far as these games go, with there just being level ups as well as equipment. Now, leveling up is going to increase your base stats a tiny bit, usually like 5 HP, but also give us a skill point. Now we can level up, of course, by fighting in various tactical battles, but that usually gives you the least amount of experience, and that's important, and we'll talk about that in a bit. The other way to get experience is from completing quests as well as finding treasures. Quest completion is relatively straightforward. There are a variety of side quests throughout the game, so there is more than just the main narrative here. And the game will tell you when you're reaching the point of no return, which is when you need to double back and do everything you can. But then we have the treasures. There are 17 of these throughout the game, and they will give you an increasing amount of experience as you move through the title, which is in addition to your regular experience. These can be very helpful in getting you leveled up if you are trying to avoid combat here and there. But once we have our level ups, each character we get a hold of, which I won't be going over all of them, because that would definitely be spoilers, will have their own unique skill tree 
poetry. Some of them do overlap a little bit, but for the most part, each character has some things unique to them, which is how they're going to get their various skills. And at max level, which is 25, you'll be lucky to get maybe two of these four trees maxed out, which means you do need to be a bit choosy, I would say, in terms of what you're spending these points on, because they are not all made equal. But then we have our equipment. Equipment basically comes down to the weapons you're using, the mods on said weapons, as well as your accessories and power cores. Power cores are essentially just accessories. They will augment your character in some way, provide you immunity to status effects, or give you extra armor. Your weapons, of course, decide how you are attacking in combat. There are a variety of them, but for the most part, it's stuff you'd expect. Shotguns, assault rifles, sniper rifles. There is an interesting one called a bouncer, which has a ricochet bullet that can allow you to set up some interesting shots. But then lastly, we have the miasma powers. Miasma powers are from our glove that Elvis has. A short ways into the story, we find out that it can manipulate miasma, which allows us to control it to do various moves in combat. We find these miasma powers scattered throughout the game. There's a variety of them, and each of them can be augmented by chips we put in our glove. These will do things like change the AP cost of the ability itself, which makes the chip that reduces the AP cost to nothing incredibly valuable, alongside just doing things like giving you extra damage or lifesteal effects on these powers, much in the way that you can mod the weapons. Weapons also have various mods that will allow you to do things like get extra range, extra crit chance in certain situations, that type of thing. So the equipment system is just diverse enough to be interesting, but it's pretty light. Though when it comes to equipment, the last thing I want to say on this is finding or buying things. One thing that I kind of figured was the case going into this, having played some of their previous work, was that buying weapons is pointless, because it is. I don't like that they sell weapons in these shops, because it somewhat feels like a trap. Some of the best weapons you're going to find, you will do just that. You'll find them out in the open. Most vendors just sell versions of weapons you can already find. So just as a piece of advice, don't buy the weapons from the vendors. They are a trap. And if you're not buying weapons from the vendors, you should have a lot of money left over. This world uses plastic as a currency, which we can find as we scavenge various areas. But if we are selling the things we're not using, you'll actually have an overabundance of plastic, which you can then use on healing or various consumables or throwables in combat, which is going to allow you to set up more tactical situations. And I wanted to mention that because this is the kind of game where you see people get stuck a good bit and a lot of that can come down to how you are spending the money you do have because money is relatively limited but if you're spending it well you'll have an overabundance. But that brings us to the stealth and combat systems. Now stealth is a large part of this game but it is not the whole game. Ultimately we'll be controlling three characters none of which I'm going to explain because again spoilers though we do get more than that. However the catch to this is there are only three silent weapons, so to speak, in the game. And one of them's not even technically a weapon, it's a skill that Elvis gets. There are only two silenced actual weapons in the game. This is important because before we enter the tactical battles, we have the opportunity to run around in real time, and we can use this to set up ambushes and take out enemies silently. This is a big part of the gameplay. It is important before combat goes loud that you neutralize as many combatants as possible, and the game gives you methods to do this via those silent weapons. Weapons. However, again, there's only two, and I would recommend you play through the story as much as possible until you get that second one, because they are kind of both just handed to you. Now, Elvis does get an ability with his Miasma Glove that is melee range that can hit people silently for a lot of damage, so if you want to play around with that, you can potentially get a third option here and have every character giving a silent attack. But in order to take enemies down effectively, you have to make sure that other enemies don't see you do this or see that enemy get taken out. And this is where consumables like the beer bottles come in that you can throw to distract enemies and get them to a more advantageous position for you to snipe. Because of this, bottles are ironically the most expensive consumable there is. Ideally, you want to use this phase of combat to thin the herd as much as possible before taking out the stragglers. However, I do want to take this opportunity to mention Combat is very rarely required in this game. There are obviously situations where it's going to come up. It is a TRPG after all. But unless it is a specific scripted instance where there's just no way past the enemies, more often than not, the mission objective is to go somewhere or get something. And if you can clear the enemies out of your way without actually engaging in full-blown combat, you can just go around them. Because I will remind you, enemies give us the least amount of experience of all the things we can do. Even the 
missions where you have to kill something, it's usually a specific enemy. And if you set up everything in your favor, which admittedly is a more tedious style of gameplay that I don't think is for everyone, then you can mitigate the difficulty on pretty much every difficulty to a point where the game is fairly easy. So to be clear, you don't have to fight everything you come across. That said, there are a few ambushes, which I think are a little cheap, which, you know, kind of is the nature of an ambush. But there are a few fights where enemies might start moving and hitting you before you've even had a chance to take cover because you are ambushed in something like a cutscene. And while that does happen a few times throughout the game, they are more the exception than the rule. But even in those fights, they are typically against fewer enemies than you would see otherwise. Once we're actually engaged in proper combat, what then? Well, let's talk about that. As I mentioned, it's a very XCOM-like system. We have two action points based on chance to hit and cover. Now, what I didn't mention in the difficulty section was the light or full tactical mode. Your chance to hit, as well as the enemies, is based off of light or full tactical. Full tactical is probably more what you would expect in regular TRPGs, where you have a chance to hit based on the enemy being in cover or not being in cover, as well as whether or not you are flanking them, and your distance to said target. So full tactical requires you to understand things like distance, cover, flanking, and actually being good at getting characters into the proper position. Light tactical is a simplified version of this. You still have a percentage chance to hit, but it uses nice round numbers. If you're flanking something, you're guaranteed to hit. You don't have to worry about things like distance as much. Cover and do you have a clear line of sight. However, understand that the enemies will play by the rules of whichever one you pick. Even if it does feel like enemies are getting ridiculously lucky with their shots sometimes, because when the game is telling me an enemy has hit me with three super lucky shots, it calls them in a row, which is like less than 20% hit chance, I have doubts. But that said, beyond that, we have the armor system. We can get armor on ourselves in a variety of ways, typically with power cores, but armor points reduce incoming damage. There are, however, skills that will eat through enemy armor. Typically, acid will do this, but some enemies are immune to that. But basically, if an enemy has armor, you're going to need to chew through that before you can do real damage to them, which means heavily armored targets probably aren't the ones you want to try to stealth ambush. But luckily, this is where the skills come in. The skills will give us things like our Overwatch ability, Abilities, armor eater shots, which will destroy armor points. Diggs gets an ability that will knock down enemies and stun them for a turn, taking their turn away. The usual tactical options here. And that's before we even start talking about things like items and throwables, where there are acid bombs that will help remove armor as well. We can throw napalm to set enemies on fire. The problem with skills, however, is that they only go on cooldown when you are in combat. That is to say, the cooldown only starts to tick down when you are actively engaged in combat combat with enemies. If you are just sniping enemies, etc., the abilities that you've used will stay on cooldown until you're back in combat, which is not something I particularly enjoy, though the goal here is to keep you from spamming abilities. But all this really does, in my opinion, is put the focus on abilities with short one to two turn cooldowns. That means you can actually use them frequently. So the abilities with like six turn cooldowns tend to be less effective, though can usually be mitigated by the use of consumables, which often have a effects that do the same thing. Consumables and items will typically only use one action point, whereas actually attacking with your weapon will typically end your turn. Which means much like every system like this, combat comes down to how well you know how to manage the action economy by both stealth ambushing enemies out of your way, distracting them, taking out as many as possible before combat goes full loud, and then once you're in combat, understanding the mechanics enough to know what your options are. And where this game shines in comparison to Mutant Year Zero is that you actually have options. Mutant Year Zero was a puzzle in the sense that there was really only like one right answer, especially on higher difficulties. And what I think Miasma Chronicles does well is actually gives you multiple options. Some are better than others, sure, but you don't necessarily have to do the same thing every time. However, if you don't want to engage with those systems and just want to rush in, that's where you're going to have a bad time because you will be outnumbered and outgunned and destroyed very quickly. And that's before we even start talking about things like miasma powers. There's a variety of these and they use your energy or your glove energy. 
you can restore this just like health. You'll get a unique item called energy cells that allow you to do this. And if you're making good use of those miasma powers and changing them out or using them effectively, reducing their AP cost to nothing, they are devastating and can really change the flow of the battlefield if you employ them correctly. So because you have all those options, it does feel like there's more ways to approach combat if, however, you're willing to stay within the bounds of those systems. Now, what I don't care much for in this game, in terms of its stealth in combat, is the crit chance in ambushing. When you are in stealth and not fully engaged with the enemy yet, and taking out enemies silently, some of them can only be taken out if you happen to get a lucky crit, and you can maximize crit chance in ambushes to be like maybe 50-60%, but because of all of the other systems in this game at play, I think the out of combat crit chance when you're ambushing enemies should just be a guaranteed critical, because that way you could take out these enemies more reliably, which is kind of what the game is going for, because situations where you're just kind of hoping you get lucky enough to take this enemy out silently, otherwise combat's going to go terribly just isn't really fun to me, especially in a game that is about setting up those perfect situations. Now, furthermore, last thing I want to mention is that enemy groups in this game work as squads. You might have noticed that each enemy has a small sort of marker next to their health. This identifies what squad they are part of. Every enemy with that particular marker will aggro if that enemy has a chance to call its reinforcements. That is to say, it sees you and then gets its next turn where it can then alert everyone. So it's a good idea to sort of scout ahead a little bit and get an idea of what enemies around will actually come after you if things go poorly. Overall, I would say I enjoy the combat gameplay of Miasma Chronicles, but I do think it could use some small tweaks to make it better. But that brings us to the world and gameplay side of things. Now, this being a TRPG, we are, for the most part, free to run around and explore outside of, you know, getting into combat. And this is done through small areas that we move through. Now, outside of combat, you can basically travel between these freely, including anywhere on the world map. You can fast travel back to places you've already been, which is going to let you stock up on consumables, even if you were kind of just in the middle of a bunch of stuff. And each individual area you can go to is pretty fun to explore. There's secret things to find. There's a decent amount of verticality to it. And exploring will usually give you the reward of various weapons or consumables to use in combat, which can make your life a little bit easier. But you can also find lore and history about what happened to this world and the world is really interesting. Exploration to me was a lot of fun because learning about this world and what happened to it was the highlight for me. And one thing I think it does exceptionally well in that regard is showing you the danger of people just living out in the miasma and why the first family, despite being awful people, are nonetheless in charge because people rely on them to get by because of everything going around. Now, obviously, they're doing this because they have access to the technology that happened previously as the world was in what they call the Great Stability, which was like the sort of technological age of peace, and the first family seized a lot of that technology when the disaster happened. But the game shows you all of this, typically through a variety of side quests that kind of show you the state of the world, some of the horrifically mutated things that are part of it, and for the most part I think they did a really good job here. I did want to mention in this part specifically the keypad codes. A common thing you'll run into when you're running around is various rooms you can only get into if you can figure out the code to them. And my advice here would be to read your codex or the notes and things you are picking up that you found near that keypad. They will almost always have the hint that you need to look at in order to figure out the code. None of them are particularly mind-blowing, but if you don't actually read those notes, you're gonna have no idea what you're looking for or how to open these doors. And behind those doors can be things like the treasures for experience I mentioned, new weapons, etc. So you're going to want to get into those places. That said, if you're on Steam, most people can just look up the Steam forums that have already figured out most of these, but none of them were too bad. I figured out all of them but one by myself, though they can be a little bit cryptic. That does bring us to our Steam Deck section of the video, though, and my experience with this game on the Steam Deck was very poor. The game does have controller support, so that's not an issue at least, but the Steam Deck really seems to struggle playing this game. I couldn't get a good frame rate to save my life, even on the absolute lowest settings this game has. 
and the game is too new to actually have an official Steam Deck rating. So while it has things like cloud saves and controller support, the experience was so poor purely on a frame rate level that I just couldn't seem to fix that it would be impossible for me to recommend this on Steam Deck, which is a shame. TRPGs usually do pretty well on that platform, but that was not my experience with this one. Now though, we have positives and negatives, and then we will wrap this thing up. Now the positive sides for me were the story and the world. The story and the world of this game were just really cool. The writing isn't always perfect in places. I won't argue that with anybody, but I really did enjoy it. And that combined with the refinements to their combat system, as someone who plays a lot of TRPGs, it was fun to mess around with that. I do think that combat system is going to be unforgiving if you don't play a lot of these types of games, but I do think they did a good job there. Now, on the negative side of things, the variety of minor bugs that I mentioned, as well as the just small little things they could change and fix. And to their credit, it's my understanding that they're supposed to be working on that already. They've responded to the Steam forums here and there, mentioning that they're working on an update that they're hoping to roll out this coming week with some some small quality of life adjustments based on the feedback of the people who have played the game as well as many of the things I've mentioned here. But as it stands right now at the time of this review, those would be my main negatives. Despite an otherwise really fun experience, it is held back by a variety of just small minor issues that pile up against a combat system that for a lot of people is going to be a bit unforgiving as it is, which can lead to a bad experience if you don't know what to expect. And that does bring us to our conclusion. The Miasma Chronicles is a refinement of the Bearded Lady's systems that they've used up to this point in a way that I found very enjoyable. The world and story are very interesting, and I think the tactical battles can be very fun. So, with that in mind, if you enjoy TRPGs a great deal, then I think this is a great one, in spite of its $50 asking price. Now, on the flip side of that, if you don't play a lot of these kinds of games, I probably would not feel very good about spending $50 on it. So for me, the recommendation on this one really just comes down to how much you enjoy this genre, because if you like TRPGs, I do think this game manages to justify its $50 asking price. But if you're on the fence at all, or you don't play a lot of these games, I would definitely wait for a sale in that case. But otherwise, I think it's a fun experience. And worst case scenario, you could just put it on narrative and still enjoy much of what the game has to offer. But that is ultimately up to you. As for me, that is everything I have to say about my Asthma Chronicles. I certainly hope you enjoy it, and I hope you enjoyed this video. If you did, like, comment, subscribe, all that YouTube jazz, but regardless of any of that, truly, just thank you so much for watching, especially if you watched this one all the way to the end. This one took me a little bit longer to get done than I thought it would because Alpha Editor took me a few tries to get right, but nonetheless, I couldn't do things like this without you people watching these videos that I make, and for that, I could not be more grateful. So with all of that said, thank you again. May you wander in wisdom and have an amazing day.